This armchair research began with me doing a little genealogy research on my wife Karen's family line. She told me her grandmother had told her as a child she was a descendant of royalty. She said, grandmother said it goes way back with dukes, earls, and ladies, princesses and princesses, and possibly kings and queens. My search got me completely back to the first century on that side of her family. First century meaning I found Jesus. Her grandmother is spinning in her grave, I'm sure, right now. But I found Jesus on the My Heritage website. In my wife's family. I'm not going to speculate how this information found its way into the site, but there are several other family lines ending up there with us as well. The name I found that got my attention was the name Joseph Rama Theo. That was 60 generations ago before my wife. 60 generations. His story is simply this. His mother fled Judea after his father's crucifixion. He was born in what was to become France. With this search, I touch on several heresies and many sects. The title to follow says it all. Here we go. The Old Testament saw Yahweh as the creator of all things, both good and bad. God giveth and God taketh away. Many of us have wondered from time to time if God is both good and evil. Rather than being only good and the bringer of all things evil, how could this be? At such times we are left wondering. While licking our wounds, nursing our hurts or grudges along while suffering in silence. If God isn't a mixture of both good and evil, how could he allow natural disasters? What about all the innocents who suffer? How can God be all loving and still be bad? Several religious movements tried to explain the difference in dualist terms. Dualism is a doctrine that the universe is under the dominion of two opposing principles one of which is good and the other evil. Zoroastrianism looks back to the Iranian prophet Zarathustra. This religion was around from 1500 to 500 BCE. Central to its view is a cosmic struggle between good and evil in which humans are called to participate. Its highly developed conceptions of spiritual beings and its eschatology probably influenced Jewish thinking in the later centuries BCE. An offshoot of Zoroastrianism was the Manichaean movement. It was founded by many around 216 CE and has an extremely dualistic view where the material world is the realm of evil and darkness. Particles from the world of light have been captured and imprisoned in matter, and knowledge, gnosis, and highly self-disciplined practices are designed to free them and return them to their heavenly home. About the same time a prominent heretical movement of the second century Christian church started. This was partly of pre-Christian origin. The Gnostic doctrine taught that the world was created and ruled by a lesser divinity, the Demiurge, and that Christ was an emissary of the remote supreme divine being, bringing esoteric knowledge, Gnosis, to enable the redemption of the human spirit. The Cathars were a Christian dualist, Gnostic revival movement of the people. They mostly lived in areas of southern Europe. The time frame was somewhere between the 12th and 14th centuries CE, common era, so, 6 to 800 years ago. The followers are now mainly remembered for a long period of persecution by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church did not recognize the beliefs of the Cathars, as even being Christian. At the center of the Cathar origins, they identify two twins, two opposing deities two gods. The first was a good god, who they say is portrayed in the New Testament and is the creator of the spirit. The second was an evil god, depicted in the Old Testament, and creator of matter and the physical world. The idea of two gods, 
one being good and the other evil, was primary to Cathar beliefs. Cathars believed that Satan had tricked a number of angels into falling from heaven and then encased them in bodies of flesh. The purpose of life to the Cathars was to renounce the pleasures and enticements of this world and its flesh. And, through repeated incarnations, repent their way back home. This was the opposite of the teachings of the monotheistic Catholic Church, whose fundamental principle was that there was only one God, who created all things good and bad. Salvation was understood as a revelation that reawakens knowledge or gnosis, in contrast, the traditional church emphasis is on redemption through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Cathar priests lived simply, had no possessions, imposed no taxes or penalties, and regarded men and women as equals. These were aspects of the faith that appealed to many who were disillusioned with the Catholic Church. Cathars rejected the teachings of the Church as immoral and most of the books of the Bible as inspired by Satan. They criticized the Church heavily for the hypocrisy, greed of its clergy, and the Church's acquisition of land and wealth. The Nicene interpretation of Christianity differed with other movements for several centuries. The Cathars were simply the latest challenges of the so-called heretical movements of the Middle Ages, to the Church. Cathars venerated Jesus and followed what they considered to be his true teachings, labeling themselves as good Christians. Cathars firmly rejected the Christian symbol of the cross, considering it to be a material instrument of torture and evil. The only books of the New Testament they accepted were the Gospels, completely rejecting the epistles of Paul and the others, with a special emphasis on the Gospel according to John. They also considered the book of Revelation not a prophecy about the future, but an allegorical chronicle of what had transpired in Satan's rebellion. In Catharism, God and Satan are two eternal, uncreated, forces of equal power. In Christianity, Satan is a fallen angel created by God and ultimately subordinate to him. Eventually, the Cathars were condemned as heretical by the Church and removed. Perhaps there is no other year more impactful on the research into the Essene way of life than 1923. In that year, a researcher was given access to the Vatican Library archives containing ancient Aramaic scrolls. In this library treasure trove, he discovered documents, among the multitude of scrolls and codices, which detailed the spiritual practices and beliefs of the Essenes, recorded by their scribes. They were very closely aligned to the Gnostic beliefs. Then with the addition of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls a few decades later, this new evidence of a thriving Essene community at Qumran in the centuries leading up to the birth of a prophesied Messiah, gives us proof that this sect was well established. The Essenes were apparently so devoted to their beliefs that they were prepared to be martyred for them. There is a widespread belief that the Knights Templar and the Cathars had a similar world view. They shared the fate of being called heretics, and of being violently attacked by the church and state authorities in France. They were subjected to arrest, interrogation, and torture during the Inquisition and in many cases executed by burning them at the stake. Some have claimed, because of shared Gnostic heritage, the Order of the Temple offered shelter to fugitive Cathars during the papal persecution. This happened a century before the Templars themselves faced destruction. The Templars in the meantime are supposed to have embraced or reaffirmed many Cathar doctrines. The two heretical groups are supposed to have been united additionally by reverence for a particular female saint, Mary Magdalene, and by having some special insight concerning her relationship with Jesus. The branch of early Christianity that became Roman Catholicism reasoned that God must have been permitting Satan's existence in order to test people's faith, and to punish the souls of the wicked in an afterlife of hell. An alternative faction explained things differently. They drew on an age-old Zoroastrian idea of two cosmic forces light and darkness locked in an endless struggle. The material world was the dominion of the evil principle the false god or demi-urge. 
There was no hell other than this created world. This world was a prison for the soul. The soul was the living part of an angel, created by the good God, but tempted by Satan into a human body. The soul, itself, belonged to the domain of light, and yearned to return there. In that spiritual paradise, was to be found, the original and true God, who transcends creation. Due to the influence of Saint Augustine of Hippo, a tendency to link the flesh and worldliness with Satan crept into the Catholic mainstream. This was later evident in the rule drawn up for a Catholic order of warrior monks. They were a radical new organization, made possible in part by another Augustinian doctrine, about it being permissible for Christians to fight and kill in defense of the faith. The rule sought to impose a grim way of life on these men, they were the Knights Templars. The Templars were founded to defend pilgrims and the frontiers of the territory taken by the First Crusade, and were based on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The Templars grew quickly, as idealistic knights joined, and as pious aristocrats donated estates to them. They matured as a fighting force during the Second Crusade, in the years 1147 through 1149. The 1140s also saw the establishment of a convent of Benedictine nuns at Bethany, near Jerusalem. Bethany was best known for the tomb where Jesus had raised Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha back to life. A nearby church marked the spot where Mary of Bethany had anointed the Christ. The Catholic Church identified Mary of Bethany with Mary Magdalene. While the Greek Orthodox Church identified two different women, neither identified as Mary Magdalene. There was also a popular cult of Saint Mary Magdalene in southern France. Mary Magdalene had been one of Christ's followers. According to the canonical Gospels, she was present at the crucifixion, and the tomb of Christ, and took the news the missing body to the disciples. John's Gospel has her as the first to encounter the risen Christ, after she lingered in the garden weeping. The early Gnostics revered her, the saint, and their writings portrayed her as a member of Christ's inner circle. They believed Christ's spirit appeared to her, after the crucifixion, to reveal to her deeper spiritual truths. Moreover, many Gnostic Christians found in her a refreshing difference to the religion constructed by Peter, Paul, and later church fathers like Saint Jerome. Gnostics believed that Mary comprehended Christ's teaching better than any other, being one of the closest people to him. According to one of the Gnostic Apocrypha, the Gospel of Philip, she was called the Companion of the Saviour, but Christ loved her more than all the other disciples and used to kiss her often on the mouth. The Catholic Church downplayed any preaching role. Mary's redemption by divine grace made her a symbol of God's forgiveness of sinners. In so far as this, she may have appealed to the Templars and the Cathars, many of whom, in their own way, had turned their backs on the God of wrath in order to follow Jesus and his Father. Because of persecution in Jerusalem, Mary Magdalene fled Palestine, and landed at Marseille with Martha and Lazarus, and preached to the pagan inhabitants. Like the Gnostics before, the Cathars elevated her above the other apostles. They may even have regarded her as the widow of Jesus. The Cathars secretly taught that Mary Magdalene was the wife of Christ. Knowledge of Christ's alleged relationship with Mary, and perhaps the proof, passed from the Cathars to the Knights Templar. The threat of this great secret along with their dualistic views were potentially damaging to the Church, so the Catholic establishment suppressed the Templars, a century later. Many authors have additionally speculated that Mary Magdalene was herself of royal blood, or a priestess of some Isis-slash-Ishtar cult, and that the Cathars and Templars regarded her almost as the embodiment of the feminine aspect of the divine and the personification of holy wisdom. It must be remembered that Mary Magdalene was a legitimate saint also for Catholics, and there was nothing inherently heretical in venerating her. Popular myth has it that the Cathars passed to the Templars a great secret to protect. 
Gnostic texts like the first apocalypse of James were likely banned because of their different understanding of what Jesus' importance was. They understood Jesus much more in terms of being a revealer of human wisdom than as a messiah. According to these Gnostic texts, Jesus taught people that the material world was actually a prison created by an evil god. In the first apocalypse of James, Jesus describes this prison to his brother and how to escape it. He reveals that the world is guarded by demonic figures, who are blocking the path between the material world and the afterlife. He tells James what he needs to get by them when he dies. There is an additional term to bring in at this point. Disposini. It is the name given to all direct descendants of Jesus. If Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene, which is a belief that was held by the Gnostic sects, and is indirectly corroborated by the apocryphal Gospel of Philip, their child or children would have been the most revered among the Disposini. And the name of her born son was Joseph. This is Karen's 60 generations back, grandfather. Mary Magdalene's exile is told in the book of the Revelation which describes that she was pregnant at the time. It tells also of how the Roman authorities subsequently persecuted Mary, her son and his heirs. And she, being with child, cried, and pained to be delivered, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads, and seven crowns, stood before the woman, for to devour her child. And she brought forth the man-child, and the woman fled into the wilderness. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war forever with the remnant of her seed. It was to Gaul that Mary was said to have carried the Sangreal, the blood royal, the holy grail, and it was in Gaul that the famous line of Jesus and Mary's immediate descendant heirs, the Disposini flourished for 300 years. From the earliest times, through the medieval era, to the great renaissance, Mary's flight was portrayed in illuminated manuscripts and great artworks alike. Her life and work in France appeared not only in works of European history but also in the Roman Church until her story was suppressed by the Vatican. Grail's traditional symbolism is of a chalice containing the blood of Jesus. We can also consider graphic designs dating back well beyond the Dark Ages to about 3500 BC. And in doing this, we discover that a chalice or a cup was the longest standing symbol of the female. Its representation was that of the sacred vessel the womb. The equivalent traditional symbol of the male was a blade or a horn, usually represented by a sword or a unicorn. In the Old Testament's Song of Solomon and in the Psalms of David, the fertile unicorn is associated with the kingly line of Judah, and it was for this very reason that the Cathars used the mystical beast to symbolize the Grail bloodline. Mary Magdalene died in AD 63. In that very year, Joseph of Arimathea built the famous chapel at Glastonbury in England as a memorial to the Messianic Queen. But who was Joseph of Arimathea, the man who assumed full control of affairs at the crucifixion? And why was it that Jesus' mother, and the rest of the family accepted Joseph's intervention without question? As late as the year 900, the Church of Rome decided to announce that Joseph of Arimathea was the uncle of Jesus' mother Mary. And from that time, portrayals of Joseph have shown him as being rather elderly at the crucifixion, when Mother Mary was herself in her fifties. Prior to the Roman announcement, however, the historical records of Joseph depicted a much younger man. He was recorded to have died at the age of 80 in AD 82, and this means he was age 32 at the time of the crucifixion. In fact, Joseph of Arimathea was none other than Jesus Christ's own brother, James, and his title had nothing whatever to with a place name. Arimathea never existed. The Arimathea title was an English corruption of the Greco Hebrew style Har Amathea, meaning of the Divine Highness, or of the Royal Highness. Since Jesus was the senior messianic heir the Christ, or king then his younger brother was the crown prince the royal highness, Har Amathea. In the early 5th century, Jesus and Mary's descendants called then the Fisher Kings became united by marriage to the Franks, and from them emerged a whole new reigning dynasty. 
They were the noted Merovingian kings who founded the French monarchy and introduced the well-known fleur-de-lis, the ancient Jewish symbol of circumcision, as the royal emblem of France. The descendant heirs of Jesus posed an enormous threat to the Roman High Church because they were the dynastic leaders of the true Nazarene Church. In real terms, the Roman Church should never have existed at all, for it was no more than a hybrid movement comprised of various pagan doctrines attached to a fundamentally Jewish base. Christianity should rightly be based on the teachings of Jesus himself the moral and social codes of a fair-minded, tolerant ministry, with the people as its benefactors. But Orthodox Christianity is not based on the teachings of Jesus, it is based on the teachings of the Roman Church, which are entirely different. There are a number of reasons for this, the foremost of which is that Jesus was deliberately sidestepped in favor of the alternative teachings of Peter and Paul teachings which were thoroughly denounced by the Nazarene Church of Jesus and his brother James. Only by removing Jesus from the front line could the popes and cardinals reign supreme. When formally instituting Christianity as the state religion of Rome, Constantine declared that he alone was the true savior messiah, not Jesus. As for the bishops of Rome, the popes, they were granted an apostolic descent from Saint Peter not a legitimate dispos any descent from Jesus and his brothers, as was retained within the Nazarene Church. The only way for the Roman Church to restrain the heirs of Mary Magdalene was to discredit Mary herself and to deny her bridal relationship with Jesus. But what of Jesus' brother James? He, too, had heirs, as did their other brothers, Simon, Josses, and Jude. The Church could not escape the Gospels which state that Jesus was the Blessed Mother Mary's firstborn son, and so Mary's own motherhood also had to be repressed. As a result, the Church portrayed Mother Mary as a virgin, and Mary Magdalene as a whore neither of which description was mentioned in any of the original Gospels. Over the course of time, these contrived doctrines have had widespread effect. But, in the early days, it took rather more to cement the ideas because the original women of the Nazarene mission had a significant following in the Celtic church women such as Mary Magdalene, Martha, Mary Jacob Cleopas and Helena Salome who had run schools and social missions throughout the Mediterranean world. These women had all been disciples of Jesus, and close friends of his mother, accompanying her to the crucifixion, as confirmed in the Gospels. The Church's only salvation was to deny women altogether, to deny them not only rights to office, but to deny them rights to any status in society. Hence, the Church declared that women were all heretics and sorceresses. In this, the bishops were aided by the words of Peter and Paul, and on the basis of their teachings the Roman High Church was enabled to become wholly sexist. In his epistle to Timothy, Paul wrote, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp any authority over the man, but to be in silence. In the Gospel of Philip, Peter is even quoted as saying that women are not worthy of life. The bishops even quoted the words of Genesis, wherein God spoke to Eve about Adam, saying, He shall rule over thee. The church father Tertullian summed up the whole Roman attitude when writing about the emergent disciples of Mary Magdalene. These heretical women. How dare they? They are brazen enough to teach, to engage in argument, to baptize. It is not permitted for a woman to speak in church, nor to claim, a share in any masculine function least of all in priestly office. Then, to cap it all, came the Roman Church's most amazing document, the Apostolic Order. This was compiled as an imaginary conversation between the Apostles after the Last Supper. Contrary to the Gospels, it supposed that Mary Magdalene had been present at the supper, and it was agreed that the reason why Jesus had not passed any wine to Mary at the table was because he had seen her laughing. On the basis of this extraordinary, fictitious document, the bishops ruled that, even though Mary might have been a companion of Jesus, women were not to be afforded any place within the church because they were not serious. 
This sexist attitude has persisted within the church to the present day. Why? Because Mary Magdalene had to be discredited and removed from the reckoning so that her heirs could be ignored. The messianic heirs retained their social positions outside the Roman church establishment. They progressed their own Nazarene and Celtic church movements and founded Dispocene kingdoms in Britain and Europe. They were a constant threat to the Roman high church and to the figurehead monarchs and governments empowered by the church. They were the very reason for the brutal inquisition. This was because they upheld secrets as well as moral and social codes that was contrary to the high church. This was especially apparent during the age of chivalry, that embraced a respect for womanhood. This was exemplified by the Knights Templars whose constitution loath supported a veneration of the Grail Mother, Queen Mary Magdalene. Prior to the Middle Ages, the individual stories of this family were historically well known. But when the church began its reign of fanatical persecution the whole Nazarene and Dispocene heritage was forced underground. But why the vengeful onset of the Inquisition? Because the Knights Templars had not only returned from the Holy Land with documents that undermined the church's teachings, but they also established their own churches in opposition to Rome. These were not just any churches, they were the greatest religious monuments ever to grace the skylines of the Western world, one of which is the Notre Dame Cathedrals of France. Despite present-day images, these impressive Gothic cathedrals had nothing whatsoever to do with the established Christian Church. They were funded and built by the Knights Templars, and they were dedicated to Mary Magdalene Notre Dame, Our Lady whom they called the Grail of the World. The Templars had secrets. The Gnostics had secrets. The Cathars had secrets. Not only that the High Church was worshipping the wrong god, but also, the secret and protection of the Dispocene.